Welcome back to This Is Hardcore Podcast. You just heard Carbonite, the track Disgrace. In the same show where we saw Hangman, Simulacra, and the band we played last week, Live It Down. I believe Carbonite, this might have been their first show. Bob Wilson put it on the Philomoka. Absolutely incredible. Lennon. Man brought us Eco Strike. Man brought us Blister. And now he's on to Carbonite. Star Wars heads obviously know what that is. For non-nerds but still seeing Star Star Wars. That's the block that trapped Han Solo once Boba Fett got his ass. So, but yeah, fantastic. Obviously a part of the whole From Within catalog, the From Within Records gang, so to speak. Make sure you're checking out From Within Podcast. They're about three episodes in, going strong. Carter, Jake Abbott, Dylan Shackled. This is the next generation of hardcore. Keeping things moving forward. Keeping things fresh. Giving respect to the past. Everything you could ask for. And so, I was just thinking about young bands or new bands more than young. And why not? Carbonite. Good job, Lennon. Hope to see you guys play some more. This is a wild weekend, guys. I know a lot of you listening probably aren't Philly people. Might even listen to it after a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is gone. But this is my fucking job. This is what the fuck we do. We talk about shit going on in Philly because we're from here. Tomorrow is the Casualties, which actually you're listening to it Friday, so it's today. The Casualties with Rotten Stitches, Stolen Wheelchairs, and Pissed from Trenton at the Unitarian Church. The Casualties at the church is going to be fucking wild. Make sure you go down there. I know everybody plays the punk card or one wears a fucking Fred Perry. Everyone knows Rancid, but... You ain't rocking the casualties. Go fuck yourself. That fucking band's incredible. Following week after that, Dennis, Bad Luck 13, Lord Set. Dennis and his brother Jermaine uh, celebrated their birthday late last month, and we're celebrating it as a Philadelphia hardcore family this Sunday. Bad Luck 13 has some original members playing on this one. Punishment, my band, OG Lineup. We got Departed, Joe Stanley's band, Nameless Prince, dude, uh, been going to hardcore shows fucking forever, got a good business, cool band, and the up-and-comers from Philly, the next breed, cycle of abuse, very uh, gloomy, heavy, I don't like the term beat down, I think it's fucking corny, but heavy fucking band, all Philly kids, so, or mostly Philly kids, so... They're opening up the show. Check it out. Yo, it's $15. Cash at the door. Ain't no fucking advanced tickets. This is old school shit. 22 years ago to the day, Punishment played our first show at the Kill Time. Bad Luck 13 played the Kill Time. It did not end well. Fire extinguishers, everybody running outside. Shit got out of hand, but that's what it was 22 years ago. You showed up to a show, you knew you were getting the fuck in. So just follow the fucking rules. Show up and get the fuck in. That's how we roll here. Uh, Speaking of other shows, we got Drain, Pain of Truth, Ingrown, Chemical Fix, Combust. That's a crazy show on a Monday night at the church. Friday, March 18th, we got Karma, Dare, Choice to Make, also at the church. And then going back to what we were just talking about, we got... The From Within Showcase. This is Eco Strike's last show, last time out. So make it a good one. Eco Strike, Payback, Magnitude, Shackled, Simulacra, Worn, Seed of Pain, Burning Strong, Final Right, Best Scar, and Off the Tracks. Wild show. And Kevin Hare's running a Battle of the Bands the night before in media. If you get on it, you get to open. Wild style. Kind of can't wait to see how that works out for everybody. In April. We got a bunch of fucking shows. First one to announce is Integrity, Age of Apocalypse, Savage Mystic. Mystic. At this is at the Polish Club in Phoenixville. We tried to get to the church. Some booking uh, things happened, and uh, it ended up at the Polish Club, which is awesome because we got a bunch of fucking shows coming to the Polish Club. Following Friday, Zabalba, Fifteen Years of Fear, with Death Before Dishonor, 
Cruel Hand, Year of the Knife, Buried Dreams, and Missing Link. That's Friday, April 9, at the Polish Club. And then Saturday, April 9, Gridiron, Matt Carl himself, the record release party. Tsunami from the Bay Area. Queensway from Baltimore. Division of Mine from Virginia. Invoke from North Carolina. And that man, Zach Barone, opening the show up with Kids Boys Carried by Six. Gridiron, Matt, Tyler, Xavier, and Will from NEG. Wild Band, this is our record release party. Going to be crazy. There are so many shows. Uh, the Gold Show, Bob put on. That shit got sold out literally in three hours. It's fucking nuts. There's tons of shows. Make sure to go to affiliationshows.com. If you didn't listen to last week's episode, I'll say it one time. This is Hardcore. is going to happen. And if you're listening, then you will hear information sometimes before anyone else. So that's all I got for you. I was going to go on some rant and banter about the importance of this punishment show and you know what it means to play a show 22 years to the day, literally on a Sunday, 22 years before that it was also on a Sunday. But when it really comes down to it is punishment was the vehicle that put every other thing in motion for me. If the things rolled all the way back to the moment where Mike Brown and I get out of the dysphoria van, onto the L train, come back to Philadelphia, I get grabbed up by the cops of the 15th District for having a blowgun on the L, get out, and then I'm psyched to do a band. If that didn't happen, there's no This Is Hardcore. There's so many things that don't happen because a lot of what would come to be connections made, friendships made, experiences had, learning lessons by failing, being the most disorganized band in the history of the world, but the most driven to constantly be on the tour, This Is Hardcore never would have happened. And um, serendipitously, it ends up on a Sunday. I thought it'd be a cool idea. Damien, who was a podcast guest last year, he's flying in from London to be a part of it. Mike Brown hasn't played a show in any band in 20-something years. Dan, who plays drums, he stopped playing drums about 15 years ago, but he's back on it just for this one. My brother, Mike Mig, he's never stopped playing in bands. In fact, it's kind of cool. This is a episode about the amazing Deluxe, Danny Schuler from Biohazard. First met Mike in the back crossing alleyways of Frankfurt. And he was walking to Ofer Studios for Owen Franklin, who as was his studio in our neighborhood. And I'm like, yo, what are you recording? He's like, oh, yo, my band Scarred for Life. Mike had a band called Scarred for Life with me and Mike. And Mike Brown and Damien and Sam, R.I.P., put this band together, we had to have another Biohazard title, so we went with Punishment. Biohazard's fucking, to me, that video just fucking blew my, blew my mind. Couldn't fucking believe it. It was just something totally different. It's a metalhead checking this shit out. Didn't know what to think about Biohazard. But, again, none of this would happen. This podcast wouldn't happen. So much of my life wouldn't happen. Maybe if Mike Mig didn't record it over if he recorded down the street. But, I mean, Mike was around. Scar for Life would play shows with Zayo and all this stuff. So we kind of knew what was going on in Bristol, even though Bristol to Frankfurt might as well have been about 100 million miles, even though it was about 20. Um, punishment put a lot of things together for me. And when the band original members started rolling and falling off like old tires... All I had was pushing the band forward and trying to make it work at constant failures, constant disorganization with very little supervision and someone to step in and go, Joe, you did your best, but got to take a, take a step back. And it was only joining Shattered Realm and trying to focus on their tour cycle that Punishment had a time to finally put the wheels down and, you know, let them go flat for a bit. And I mean, we had, I mean, anybody around here has seen us played. We've played a bunch of benefit shows, but it's never been with these guys. And um, I'm excited to do it. I really love Dennis. I'll tell you a funny story before we get on with this Danny stuff is that early on, I was a long hair and I didn't look like the part for hardcore. But due to Bushy and rolling up, and I don't know who he met first. Um, 
I met Chris Doc at a 25 to life show and I had Chris Doc would dat me up. He was kind of like, yo, you're a Philly dude. He always gave me love, but like it really was bushy going down and starting to become cool with downtown people that really started pulling the neighborhood guys. Cause he's a couple years older than us. And we started getting around Jamie Davis from bad luck, Jason Goldberg from bad luck. You know, as more of these guys were, we were going to more shows and interacting with these guys it was these guys who put all this stuff into my head. Stuff I say on this podcast, stuff I live with my whole life. There's a reason why I love vision and maximum penalty and turning point and confusion and killing time. It's because of these guys. These fucking guys that... So it's crazy to think all my old heads are now turning 50. And I love them. And the neighborhood kids who would come after us obviously would start bands like Horror Show and Blacklist It. And it keeps, you know, One Dead, Three Wounded, um, Kill Verona. I mean, there's so many different people from the neighborhood who eventually do music. But let it be known is that it's the bad luck guys. And, you know, Dennis being a part of it that really set the tone and set the example that we continue to follow and that we continue to, you know, Hold hold the faith down, man. We hold the fort down. We keep the fucking faith. And I'm just lucky that as I was finding hardcore and learning my ways in a chaotic city that was full of fist fights and Nazi fights and, you know, it was the guys like Dennis and standing up in the front and smashing people and following their example and, you know, basically him turning around to us and being like, look, motherfucker, this is what we do. We fucking smash Nazis. That's what the fuck this is. And being 15 turning 16, it was like, fuck, I guess this is what we do. You know, I came from metal where there'd be 30 Nazis sick Heiling and no one would do nothing about it. But shit changed. Philly changed. And we took over and kept running with a lot of what those guys had set down. And out of my eternal love and respect for my big brother, Dennis, I'm really happy that we're able to do something for his 50th birthday. Much love to his twin, Jermaine, who did not make the flyer. This is mainly about Dennis, unfortunately, Jerm, but it is what it is. We love you, too. I hope you guys come out. Young kids from Philly, this is your chance to see punishment. This is your chance to see some wild bad luck shit. And uh, make it count. Not every show will be happening every couple weeks, you know. Sometimes a band plays once. It is what it is. I don't know the fucking future, but I'm not going to promise anybody shit besides we're going to show up and give us our fucking best, and I hope you're going to see it. Now on to Danny Schuler. Recently, I got wind that Danny Schuler had joined Dan Anastasi, Anastasi in his project, Kings Never Die. Dan was in Mucky Pup. He would be in Doggy Dog. If you guys saw the pre-show with Leeway at the Underground Arts 2019, you would have seen Dan on guitar. And then Dan at that amazing Madball Leeway Wisdom and Chain show in the fucking winter storm. And Dan started a new project called Kings Never Die. And for whatever reason, he rebooted it. Changed up some members and brought in the fucking big guns. Danny motherfucking Deluxe Schuler from Biohazard. Not only is Danny a class act and someone who speaks well of every person he's ever interacted with. I've never heard Danny say really a negative thing. Always been super positive, but I don't know if hardcore, and you got to think about this, this is chronologically important to understand. Killing Time is playing now. Breakdown demos out. Biohazard enlists Danny Deluxe. Jumps up on there. And it's like this record scratch And tempos and rhythm of hardcore change forever. Once Biohazard really starts laying it down. And the argument can be made when the LP came out. The one that ended up on Maze. That thing would forever divert some paths. And Biohazard, iconically, aesthetically, visually, and musically, has a huge impact on 90s. And every generation after hardcore scene, period. Foundation level band. Everybody I know has a biohazard tattoo. Got one on my elbow, named our band after him. The amount of love and respect given to biohazard from so many people is universal. And 
we were chit chatting about him joining the band. He wanted to send me some tracks. I'm like, dude, I'd love to have you on the show. And he said, anytime. This man has a job, day job. He also has some kids. So this is a shorter one, but we're going to do another one with part two. So let's roll into Danny. He tells some fun stories, early days at Biohazard, and we leave off on a high note, and we're going to bring him back. Let's fucking go. Today we are talking to none other than Deluxe, Danny Schuler from <laughs> the pivotal foundation hardcore band for so many of us biohazard and that's not where he stops i mean he's got the new project kings never die and um i'm just excited to have you on the show danny thank you for coming on yeah no problem man my pleasure i gotta i gotta hold this next to my head to hear you got real quiet all of a sudden but my pleasure to be here man it's it's uh it's good to talk to you bro so we always start things at the very <clears throat> beginning and um i'd love to hear not only where you grew up and like what the environment was like, but when your first beginnings of picking up music, what your parents were listening to and like what drove you to start playing an instrument. Me? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> growing up, uh, my, my, uh, my parents were both, uh, they weren't musicians, but they were both like very musical people. Like they were both really into music. My mom was into Elvis and the Beatles and my dad was into rock and roll and everything. So our house, <clears throat> um, as a kid, you know, we always had music on. But for some reason, I was just, I don't know, I don't know what it was that got me into the drums. I remember watching, like, Elvis in concert years ago with my mother and watching the drummer playing these, like, blue sparkle drums. And I was just like, that looks pretty cool right there, you know what I mean? But... Um, I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't really think about becoming a drummer until later on when my oldest brother Joe brought home like Kiss records, and you know all that stuff, and uh, you know Black Sabbath, and my, you know my neighbor came by with a Black Sabbath record on my fifth birthday, and played it for me, and uh, it's actually hanging on my wall right in front of me, autographed, but. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's really what inspired me, just like everybody else, you know, was the great, like, heavy metal of the, you know, mid-70s. And then, you know, like, my older brother got into, like, uh, punk rock and, and hardcore, and he started going to shows in New York in the early 80s, my oldest brother. And um, that's what led to, uh, and, and also my best friend, Mick, that's what led to my interest in, um, first in punk rock, you know, like punk, like from California and then from England and then um, <clears throat> hardcore, like, you know, the bands from New York that were doing it. Were you guys uh, were you guys in the Brooklyn borough? What? Were you from Brooklyn or what borough were you from? No, I grew up in Brooklyn, man. Yeah, so was I um, raised. So a, a lot of people on this show have, and it's awesome you hit these points, a lot of people have brought up Black Sabbath and Kiss as being like two specific um artists with records that were like foundation moments, like sh yeah. like life-changing moments. So I wonder at that time when, uh, as you're growing up and you start, where you start listening to this music, did you seem like, were you viewed as like, oh, you, this kid's crazy. Why is he listening to this heavy metal? Or was it pretty accepted in your neighborhood that you were listening to this music? No, my, wait, I got to put headphones on. Hold on one second. Yeah, sure, no problem. I was asking specifically if when you started listening to this kind of music, like Black Sabbath and Kiss, did that make you stand yeah. out in the neighborhood or were you just, was that what, what everyone was listening to? Oh yeah. No, my neighborhood of Brooklyn was all about Saturday night fever and, you know, disco and, and, you know, all that kind of shit when I was a kid. And, um, you know, the, the heavy metal stuff was like, that wasn't what the Pisons in my neighborhood were listening to. You know what I mean? So it definitely was not accepted at all. You know, when me and my friends were like growing our hair or walking around with purple mohawks, you know, it was not appreciated whatsoever in our neighborhood. I grew up in a very old school, mostly Italian, Irish uh, neighborhood in Brooklyn. So yeah, I had, you can a, imagine I had a what it was like. I had a vision of that Son of Sam movie where the one guy came totally uh, punk rocked out. <laughs> you know, yeah. but um, for me, I love hearing that it's a passed down thing. Like you had an older brother 
And then how yeah. did how did he end up finding the early punk rock and New York hardcore? Like, do you know how he even found it? My oldest brother Joe, he just uh, he had a friend. His friend um, Lou, his friend uh, Lou <clears throat> was um, I don't know. Must have stumbled into a show at CBGB's on a Sunday afternoon or something. And uh, I just remember my brother and my I remember my brother coming home from like seeing the chrome eggs and and like the plasmatics for the first time um wow. and telling me about it and being like yo it's a whole other thing it's crazy and then you know not long after that me and my friends started um <clears throat> getting on the train and spending the days in the lower east side of manhattan uh where we were exposed to it ourselves at a very young age so you know that's that was really my uh my introduction to to the underground music scene in New York, but I was, I was always like a rock guy always. And, and like the punk rock thing happened for me very early on, like when I was a little kid. Um, and then I kind of forgot about it for a while until, until like the mid eighties when it, uh, you know, I just kind of got linked into it again. A bunch of my friends were going to hardcore shows and, um, they were like, you know, you got to listen to this Chrome Egg shit and, and you got to listen to this Agnostic Front stuff. And they just turned me on to it. And I was like, this is great, you know. And just the fact that the bands were from New York and they were local guys. And like, you know, we knew some of the guys in the bands and stuff like that just made it even even cooler, you know, because it was just like, yo, this is a New York thing. These are New York guys. These are like, you know, these are like people that we know. You know, it was just, it just made it like a, a cool, familiar thing. I I grew up in a similar kind of situation where we're, our neighborhood didn't really like the way that we were coming up. And it was in traveling on the train down to the shows downtown where we really started linking up like as a group of people all through the different neighborhoods that the train would link through. So I, I get what you're saying. Um, was there other people that you would eventually meet down in the Lower East Side that you would end up finding out they're from Brooklyn, or did you guys all kind of come from Brooklyn down to the shows and meet people down in the uh, Lower East Side? Well, it was uh, me and, like, three of my friends were, were the guys who would always venture out, get on the train all night, and end up in, in Greenwich Village. And, um, <clears throat> we, you know, we used to get in all kinds of trouble just running around down there. It was, it was crazy back then you know, in the uh, mid to late 80s, you know, that neighborhood was insane. And it was like, you know, a bunch of long head kids from from Brooklyn running around down there. It wasn't wasn't a good idea. You know, it was not a safe neighborhood. But I mean, in that time, I met a lot of guys who I still know to this day, guys who were, uh, you know, in bands and stuff like that. Um, just from hanging around, just from, you know, going to bars and and stuff like that. I you know, I, we, we went to CB's, we went to shows, but I wasn't at CB's every weekend. You know, I kind of missed, like, the whole, like, classic era of New York hardcore. Like, I was too young, and I kind of got into it a little after the fact. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of missed that that first wave of New York hardcore, you know? Um, obviously, Biohazard, I mean, we were... Biohazard was like an 1989 kind of deal, not a 1985 kind of deal. You know what I mean? So we came after the fact, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, if you, when you look at it, at, at the chronological history of, of, of the hardcore bands and, and the hard bands that came from New York, Biohazard came along later. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say that you're probably one of the few people one of the few people in the podcast that have taken the time to speak about, like, cause we talk a lot about like the first wave of stuff, which was like the Max's Kansas city and the 79, 81 stuff. And then when it started being down in CBs in the, um, that era, a lot of people try to do their best to tag themselves into, Oh, I was this far back in the hardcore. It was kind of cool that you're like, yo, I missed some of it. Cause you don't really hear too many. Oh, people I did. I missed, I, now, you know, I missed it completely. I was a little kid. I was, you know, 10 years old, you know, in 1981 or 1980, you know, I, so I, I missed all that. I, like I said, I didn't, I, I'm not, I'm not an OG, you know, New York hardcore guy who was there in 1982. I wasn't there. Um, but my brother was at some of those shows 
and uh, my friends were going to some of the later shows and turned me on to it. And, you know, I got into it a little later on, but, I, you know, I was lucky enough to see all the great shows and, and I don't know, I'm just a fan of it. You know what I mean? Like anything else. I'm, a, I'm still a fan of it to this day, all the great bands, you know? What, um, at what point, is it earlier than when you start going to shows or is it shows that really get you to start really focusing and playing drums? Like what was the impetus to get you to start playing? Well, I, I, like I said, I started playing drums, Well, I didn't say it, but when I was a little kid, I wanted to play the drums when I was four years old and I ended up getting a drum set when I was five years old on, you know, for Christmas, you know what I mean? Uh, I remember that year, all I wanted was a leather jacket like Fonzie and a drum set like Peter Chris. That's and, cool um, shit. <laughs> so yeah, that's when I that's when I started playing the drums. But when I really started playing, I was around 13 years old. So that was when I like had like a drum kit that I borrowed from some kid in the neighborhood in my basement. And that was me playing along to records and really trying to learn. And that was probably around 1982-ish at that time. Um I played for a couple of years and then kind of got lost in life, you know, just being a young guy, you know, um, you know, 13, 14 years old, my family fell apart. A lot of bad things happened in our, our personal lives and stuff. And I was just kind of like lost. I was, you know, out in the street with my friends, just wanting to hang with my friends and dropping out of school and at a real young age and all that stuff. So I kind of lost the whole drum thing. And then um, when I was around 16, well, actually, uh, let me go back. When I was about 14, I joined a a pretty popular band in Brooklyn that was called Crystal T. And they were like a, what you would call back then a top 40 band. Like they would play Lemoore's and they played cover songs. Like the whole set list was like early Van Halen and Black Sabbath and and stuff like that. And there were older guys from my neighborhood in Brooklyn. And um, I was about 14 years old and I joined their band, you know, with like these 25 year old guys who were playing around the tri-state area of New York. And that was my first experience of, of like playing live shows, you know, with these older guys playing bars in New York City. Um, it didn't last long, lasted about a year or so. And then I was kind of like lost after that, just kind of disillusioned like I, the the music i didn't want to play that kind of music i wanted to do something different and uh it was around that time in the mid 80s that a friend of mine played me the uh first bad brains record or actually rock for light it was and that that was like a life changer for me you know bad brains you know hearing the bad brains and then i against i came out and i just became a fanatic and I just, I knew that I wanted to do something more in that vein, less of like a rock thing, more of like what they were doing. And um, it just became my obsession after that. You know, I just wanted to be in a band. And, you know, I, I bummed around Brooklyn, like playing with a couple of other bands, filling in for a band here and there, just anything to play. Like, I didn't care who I played with, but I knew in my mind I had the ultimate goal of like doing something musically that me, that moved me the way bad brains you know you know moved me the, or the way led zeppelin moved me you know those are my two favorite bands my whole life so uh that was that was the motivation and so when i was around 16 or 17 i started really playing drums again and writing songs you know i played guitar and everything also and i started writing songs and like i was jamming with some of my friends trying to put bands together but it never worked out and uh, and then one one afternoon, me and my girlfriend at the time, I was about 18, went to a show um, down by like Avenue A. Some I can't remember exactly who was playing. I think uh, I can't remember who was playing, but it was a show down there. And I ran into Evan and, uh, you know, Evan Seinfeld and Evan and I, we actually had a band when I was about 11 years old. I knew Evan. We grew up in the same neighborhood. So I was aware of Biohazard. I had already seen them play. I, I grew up, like I said, with Evan and Anthony Mio, the original drummer. And I knew Bobby Hamble just from the neighborhood. And uh, Evan came up to me. He was like, hey, man, we need a new drummer. What are you doing? And I was like, I ain't doing nothing. I'm just writing songs and playing drums and just looking for something good. And he was like, why don't you come jam with us? 
And my girlfriend was like, yeah, do it. You know, I had seen Biohazard already. They already had the first demo out. And I liked about four songs on the first demo, but I didn't love all of it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. There was a couple of songs on there where I was just like, ah, you know, but there was a couple of really cool songs on there that I really liked. So I was like, all right, I'll come down to the studio. And I went down to the studio and, and um, they were auditioning drummers. And I had no idea that it was an audition. You know what I mean? So they had like. Were they like lined up? They have like guys. Like yeah. Lined up. <laughs> they had like a couple of guys there with their girlfriends, like hanging around. And, uh, you know, I didn't know it was like that. I didn't know it was going to be like, you know, an audition, like a whole corny process. But, uh, I, you know, I stuck around and, and, um, and we sat down, we played a couple of songs and I remember Billy just kind of looking at me like, wow, it sounds good. And Bobby was like, Danny, you know, I can't believe this. This is crazy. We were in high school together. What the fuck are you doing? And I was just like, yo man, let's play, you know? So I started rehearsing with them and then they were like, you know, they had a show coming up with like MOD or something. And they were like, yo, can you do the show? And I was like, yeah, you know, but they never told me I was in the band, you know, they was, uh, they were giving you a dry run. Well, no, they were just kind of like, they were conflicted because I was like this long haired rock dude. You know, I wasn't like a skinhead, you know, and they weren't sure about me. You know, they, I didn't fit the image of their band. You know what I mean? Um, they were like, you know, they were very concerned about the way I looked, you know, cause I didn't look cool, <laughs> you know, just being honest, I didn't look cool. So they, they, they didn't, they were kind of like, they wanted me there because they liked the way I played the drums and they liked me, but they weren't a hundred percent committed to having me in the band. And then they were like, they, a show came up at the Sundance in Long Island and they wanted me to play. And I was like, yeah, let's go do it. So I went and did the show with them. And I just remember after the show, Bobby Hamble walked over to me and he was like, yo, I don't care what anybody says. The way we play together is magic and you got to join the band. And I was like, yo, I'm in, I'm in, I'm, you know, let's do it. And then from there on out, that was it. Evan and Billy still haven't told me I'm in the band. 30 something, 40 years later, whatever it is. <laughs> Dude, that's fucking great. Now, when you go back to the... um. Did playing in that Crystal T band expose you yeah. to Lemoore's, or were you aware of Lemoore's yeah. before? Were you aware of Lemoore's before you started playing in that band? Oh well, I, I was always aware of Lemoore's because that was like a legendary club in our neighborhood. Um, but I did I played there with them in 1984. So I what was Le, huh? what was the Lemoore Bills like before like the what people in hardcore associate with Lemoore's? Like Lemoore's always have like I heard a story about. Uh, Ramones having the mob open for them at Lemoore's one time. So I know they were doing punk rock, but like, what kind of shows were going on Lemoore's when you were checking? Yeah, I when saw were... the Ramones at Lemoore's, <laughs> and it Holy was only shit. about two hundred people there. Like, it wasn't, you know. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, Lemoore's just did whatever made sense. Like, whatever would put people at the club in the bar. That's the show they would do. They weren't. It, it wasn't like how CBGB's was dedicated to underground music or anything like that. Lemoore's, they didn't care. They were businessmen. They just wanted whatever band drew, you know, drew people and brought people in. That's that's what they wanted there. And they trusted a local kid to kind of be the promoter, um, Ken Creedy. And Ken, um, you know, it's a guy who really, he put us all on. You know, it was kind of like his idea to like, start bringing, um, you know, hardcore shows into Brooklyn and start, you know, branching out into that thing. And uh, it was be really because of him and another couple of guys that, that uh, the local shows started blowing up at Lemoore's. But, um, you know, back in 1984, when I played there with this band, Crystal T, you know, it was just like a, uh, a cover band night. It was like a bar, you know, it was like, come on in, they're playing all the hits and, you know, Two dollar drink specials until midnight, that kind of thing, you know. Now, when I think about Lamar's, I just think about like the because we played there a couple of times. How did the neighborhood react to like a club in the middle of the neighborhood drawing like all these long hairs and shit in there? It was always a problem, always <laughs> a problem. I mean, you've been to Lamar's, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's right in the middle of a of the neighborhood neighborhood in Bensonhurst, and I mean Bensonhurst ain't the same now as it was in 
you know, the early 80s. But, you know, you're talking about a hardcore Italian neighborhood, wise guys everywhere, you know, uh, a lot of dudes running the street down there. You know, they they didn't want to have these uh, freaks, you know, playing each other. And, and there's a police station right around the corner full of Moors. So it was like there was constant trouble, constant fights in the street, constant police activity. It was just chaos there so many times. I mean, it, you know, it was crazy. I, 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 I can tell you stories about the trouble we got in. Now, at this point, we lose Danny for a second. And we had to reconnect the conversation, and he picks up with the chaos of Lemoore's in Brooklyn at that time. Uh, Lemoore's, yeah, it was just it was crazy there. You know, it was like Lemoore's was like a meeting place for um, for people from all over the place. I mean, when a, when a big show happened in Brooklyn at Lemoore's, it was like you had kids coming in from Long Island. You had a whole crew of kids coming in from Queens. You had crews of kids coming in from the Lower East Side. You had crews coming in from Staten Island, from Jersey, you know, it was just, and from Philly, you know, it was just like, and even like upstate, I knew guys coming from like Troy and Albany coming down to shows at Lemoore's, you know, regularly. So it was like a whole crew of guys and, you know, yeah, there was always fights, always like beef, you know, craziness going on down there. And it was just, you know... <laughs> There, there was just, it was such a crazy place. Like I, I've told people so many times these stories about what the club was like and the bouncers and, and the owners, the way they handled business down there. And I mean, the things we saw going on at that club were unbelievable. I mean, I, I saw, I don't want to mention names, but I saw legendary like national act bands, bands that still exist today and sell out stadiums, play Lemoore's and like, try to leave because they got upset with, you know, their rider wasn't filled or something like that and like get in their bus. And like, I, I saw the bouncers just bust onto their bus, pull them off, put them back in the club and the owners, you know, tell them you're going to play or else, you know, and these guys are like crying, you know, bands <laughs> like California, Ooh, you know, I mean, I seen it happen, uh, you know, the, there were guys that, you know, I seen uh, another legendary guitar player guy try to, like, get get a little stupid in the club one night. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't realize where he was in Brooklyn. There was no warning. You know, you didn't get a warning like, hey, do that again. You're in trouble. You know, you do something stupid, you got smacked up. And I seen this guy get the shit smacked out of him backstage. And he's still around today, man. Big legendary guitar player. You know, selling 10 million records, you know, I don't want to mention names, but I seen him get smacked in the face and cry like a little girl and told to go get on stage, get your guitar, and then get the <laughs> fuck out. And, I mean, that was the way they handled things back then in Brooklyn, man. And it was just like, you, you didn't play around at that club. I got thrown out of there head first more than once, and it was not a good experience, man. Those, those doors hurt, and, <laughs> you know. It was a crazy place, man. I mean, That's a fuck. I don't know if you know Big Joe, Big Joe Lawson. He was, uh, yeah, Big Joe, yeah. one of, you know, one of our brothers, one of our great friends. He, um, you know, he was one of the bouncers back then. And he was just a street guy, you know, just a street guy. And uh, <laughs> the, the way they handled the security at that club, man, it was unbelievable. It was, it was something else. You couldn't get away with it today. That's for sure. No, no, not in any regard, especially no. with the fucking internet and all that. Now, when you when you take yeah. on playing with Biohazard, obviously the scene, the there's the hardcore scene, there's like this quasi hardcore metal scene, there's all these different things all happening because we're talking about 88, yeah. 89 now, right? Yep. I started with Biohazard. So and uh, I was eighteen years old, it was about nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, so like I mean, right there and then you have some of the best crazy hardcore records out, like yeah. the Leeway records out, the yeah. DB records out. Youth of today is huge, but also Carnivore yeah. is a big deal in that regard. Um, and hardcore is starting to bleed um, into metal and vice versa more in the way that hardcore bands are getting more opportunities to play with metal. So Biohazard to me 
seemed like this kind of amalgamation of like like you um there's definitely like the hardcore punk rhythms there's definitely some hip hop elements and it, and it's always been one of the most unique sounding bands that have come across and I think it adds to the legacy of why the name stays popular for all these years and um obviously from the demo you can hear some of the tracks but when you guys started when, when you when they had those tracks you were involved in kind of bringing them into what they would end up on that first record that would end up on maze, right? Like you were involved with the writing or do they have a lot of that on that, um, already kind of laid out uh, the joined? songs that were on the first record. Um, yeah, they had written a couple of them, but when I joined the band, I wrote but a you few were a part songs of with them also for the record. Yeah, there's a there's always people that the, the the name that the word that always comes up, and I've always wondered, and I'd like to hear your perspective on it. Obviously, telling us about Brooklyn, there's this urban there's this urban like tincture to the band, just in presentation. But were you guys influenced by the different rhythms of the hip hop stuff that was also really big in New York and the underground at the time? Just kind of like change up how we traditionally play like a metal or hardcore Definitely. song. I mean. Um... My neighborhood where I grew up was called Canarsie. And Canarsie was very much, uh, when I was a kid, hip-hop was everywhere in that neighborhood. So it was like, um, I mean, there was no way to stop the influence of it. You know, and uh, I mean, f for, for Bobby and Evan also, you know, Bobby grew up in Flatlands. Evan grew up in Canarsie too. We were exposed to hip hop at a very early time. I mean, it was the music in the streets when we were kids. So that influence was going to be there no matter what. And, you know, when I joined Biohazard, um, I, I, I remember they, they were kind of like, you know, the songs on the demo, we kind of want you to play it the way it is on the demo. And very early on, I was like, eh, I don't like. I'm going to change it, you know? And the first guy in the band to kind of like be like, yeah, change it was Bobby Hamble because me and him were rehearsing. I remember, and we were playing some of the early stuff, stuff that I wasn't a part of the band when they wrote. And I just kind of like started changing the feel of it a little bit, just to kind of give it like a different kind of feel. And he was just like, yes, yes, that's great. That's great. That's great. And so at the beginning, they weren't too open to that different kind of change, but as we wrote songs together, those influences all started creeping in. And uh, not just from me, but from Evan also. Evan was very into hip hop. Um, and and he brought a lot of that influence into the band too. You know, not just my drumming. It was, you know, those guys too. I mean, we it was just the way, it was just the way we kind of like put the songs together. You know, like very early on, I, we had conversations about, bands that we loved you know we me and bobby and and uh billy and evan we would sit around and talk about records that we loved and it was always like chromag's demo chromag's age of quarrel um you know eye against eye um <clears throat> carnivore retaliation you know sheer terror it was always like we would talk about bands that we loved and i remember listening to um either I, I think it was retaliation and just kind of being like, we'll never outdo how great this is, you know? And then like, we'd listen to like the bad brains and I'm like, D we can't do better than that. And I remember Bobby was just like, that's why we got to do something new. You know what I mean? Like we all kind of figured the best music was already made by Chromags and bad brains and, you know, Minor Threat and all those bands. And it was just like, if we're going to just be another one of those bands, nobody's going to know who we are. We have to add something to this. We have to kind of like do something a little bit different. And it was just like, let's just do whatever we think is cool, you know? And so when we started writing the songs, we weren't afraid to like throw in a little, a little hip hop kind of like cadence to the vocals or like a different kind of hit you know kind of feel to the drum beat you know what i mean we weren't afraid to try that kind of thing and you know people kind of liked it it was it became like a certain sound you know what i mean and uh around that time too there were you know anthrax was doing stuff with 
uh, public enemy and like, you know, people were warming up to the idea of it kind of coming together. But in New York City, it was always one thing. You know what I mean? We all just listened to music. We didn't really separate, you know, this is hip hop. This is metal. This is, you know, we all just kind of listened to whatever was good. So that was the attitude when we were writing songs with Biohazard. That's how that all kind of creeped in there. And, um, yeah, that was, it, it, it wasn't any like big, uh, uh, plan, like, like thought out plan. It was just kind of something that happened naturally. Yeah. It seemed like it was yeah. an organic process because it seems, especially when we're talking about the surroundings and your other influences. And I like that you mentioned sheer terror. And I love the fact that like, these are bands that are already having a name in your area. So who wants to be the second rate version yeah. or the third version of that? I, I love that. That yeah. was your take. I mean, they were, all those bands that I mentioned are truly at the top of their game and made records that can't be duplicated. You know what I mean? Just can't hate enough. Retaliation, Age of Quarrel, Eye Against Eye. These are records that are the pinnacle of of hardcore punk to me. You know, the East Coast hardcore punk. And, uh, you know, we, we knew we couldn't touch that. We couldn't do it better than them. So we had to do something a little different, you know, that played to what we understood and, and our strengths. And, and that was, you know, the influence of, of a little hip hop and, and more metal and, you know, all that stuff. And then also the Lemoore's played a big part in it too, because they were always putting together shows that put, you know, they would have King Diamond with Cro-Mags opening up. You know what I mean? They would have, uh, uh, you know, like like hardcore bands playing with metal bands all the time. You know, so th there wasn't like a big separation there. Yeah, I, I, at, that, at that time, uh, Chromax did a whole tour with destruction, with yeah. destruction, and um, and I booked I booked Crowbar a couple years back at uh the Barbary, and I was talking to Homeboy about playing, and he's like, I'd like to play hardcore, man. Before we were called Crowbar, we were called Deadbolt. We opened for Destruction and Chromax and Tupelo, and I'm like, holy <laughs> fuck, that's cool. yeah. like, that's a cool as shit, <laughs> you know? Like, so. For, I, I asked you that to start um, wondering for people who obviously weren't around at the time, was Biohazard one of the bands that was able to play both with metal and hardcore? And were you guys starting to travel beyond the New York City tri-state area at that time? Yeah, we, we were playing outside of New York right away. Like as soon as, well, the band was doing shows for like six months before I joined and they had already played like Washington, D.C. and stuff. So when I joined the band, like that summer of 1989, we went up to Albany, we went down to D.C., we played in Long Island, we played in Boston. We were already covering <clears throat> like a lot of, lot of the Northeast, you know, and that was kind of like the goal right off the bat. I remember Billy being very like, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, not adamant. Um, uh he was very driven to like have us go and play out of town. You know, that was like Billy's thing. Like, yo, we got to play Boston. Yo, we got to play upstate. Yo, we got to go to Montreal, you know? And um, we, we actually were, we actually got on shows. Like we played the channel in Boston. We played the rat in Boston. We used to play club Babyhead in Rhode Island regularly. Um, you know, upstate, it was like um, in Albany, we would play uh, uh, Saratoga Winners on Sundays and, and like, uh, you know, the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. And, and all these spots. We were, you know, we were playing these places and we were actually getting shows. I don't know how the hell we were getting shows back then because nobody knew who the band was. But I, I think it was just because we were literally like always in everybody's face, like, you know, Billy and Evan were always in people's face. Like, you know, where Biohazard put us on a show, you know what I mean? And we were willing to just show up and play for no money. You know, like, for example, the first time we played the 930 Club in Washington, D.C., we opened up for um, Bobby Steele from The Undead, from uh, uh, Misfits with The Undead, you know, which is kind of yeah. like a weird bill if you think about it. But, I mean, that's a freaking yeah, cool definitely. show if you ask me, you know what I mean? What also shows the diversity, um, 
diverse kind of like yeah. lineups you could be a part of. Now you said you should, you were you playing did you join did you join before or after the Rock Hotel show that in eighty nine? Um what do you mean the rock they didn't play the actual rock hotel. You're talking about the Ritz shows? Oh all right. I, yeah, no, yeah, I was the in Ritz the band shows. at the Ritz, yeah. So you guys got to play. Oh no, no, no. Mag that was right show? before I joined the band. Oh fuck. That's because right, I have that fl- I literally have that flyer mm-hmm. now. Like I always do notes. And I was, that's why I was like bringing that up. But um I, I know that Biohazard was like a um a band that I would see thanked by both thrash metal bands and hardcore bands in the in the thank you list. So I know that you guys were crossing over beyond just hardcore at that time. And it seemed like you guys were a fit bill no matter who you guys ended up with. Yeah, I guess we um we we had elements of all that, so it it kind of worked with whatever band we were playing with. You know, early on we played with Overkill. Early on we also played, like you said, with the Chromags, and it worked. So you know, we were I guess appealing to uh, both the metal and the hardcore thing. And and like I said, in New York, um, those those kind of things were coming together anyway. Lamores was booking shows that had hardcore bands with punk bands with metal bands all the time. You know, it was just a scene of, of underground music. It didn't matter what it was. And, it was, you know, it was cool. That's really part of what shaped the attitude of our band. You know? When the band is performing and, and moving forward, was the idea of the record, like, okay, we've had a demo. Like, what, what brought on the the push to, like, put together those songs and try to find a label? Or did someone start coming to you for that? We uh, we were just playing shows. That was our whole thing. It was like every weekend, you know, where we playing Jersey, where we playing Philly, where we playing upstate, where we playing. It was just like every weekend, play shows. We loved to play. It was fun. We had a lot of friends. We always had friends in bands that would come with us. So we were just really, um, just really caught up in playing shows, and and you know rehearsing all the time. Um, the record like like making a record and that kind of thing that only really came up because uh this guy named john morris just showed up one day and was like hey you know i got this record label you know we uh why don't you guys make a record and we'll put it out you know what i mean and we were just like you know okay you know who who are you you know and he was like you know, I'll, I'll, we'll pay to record your album and we'll put your album out. We'll make it a big thing. You know, we'll, we'll like get it out there and, you know, you can put out a record, you can put out a CD and, and start selling, them, you know, and we hadn't really even thought much about it at the time. Our manager was a big, rich Frayne. I don't know if you know, rich Frayne from Brooklyn, but rich was friends with this guy, John. And John had gotten a job working for Maze Records, which was like some Canadian dude who came down to uh, Valley Stream, Long Island, and set up a record label and was like putting out Saga records and stuff. And he wanted to do like a cool rock band, you know, that was like his thing. So this kid, John, was like his man on the street. And this guy ended up going to Lemoore's, coming to a biohazard show. And, you know, Lemoore's had 1,500 kids crammed into it. And he was like, holy shit, we got to we gotta sign this band, make this record. And that was really how it happened. You know, there was no, there was no other, there was no great plan. There was no big scheme. There was no negotiation. It was just like, yo, these guys want to make a record. You guys want to do it? And we were like, yeah. And we did it. it never got paid. <laughs> but that was how the first record came out. Yeah, there was a couple bands that kind of got ripped off by them, A lot them, of bands right? got ripped off by them. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't the only ones. Uh, well, you guys were, I mean, if we're, what is this like? Um, if you're, what are you, 19 yeah. at the time yeah. when this is happening? Yeah. So, I mean, at 19 years old, you're not like thinking what like the most business acumen, like how do we, you know, like, put it this way. This is how like, it was to be able for me, do it. right? It was like the summer of 1990. We signed the deal. And uh, I remember we each got a check for $300. And I was like, whoa. 
I don't got to work for the rest <laughs> of the year. You know, it was just like, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, great. we each had, we each got a check for 300 bucks. And, um, and we went to a studio in New Jersey and the sound man from Lemoore's who did like the live sound came and he was like, I'll record the record. And, you know, we just, in like four days recorded the first album and that's it. You know, that was it. It was done. And, you know, our sound man, Bruce mixed it for us and, and, you know, that was it. It was that simple, you know? And then we had like a record release party at, at Lemoore's and, you know, that that's when the madness started. When that first record came out, um, I don't think anybody thought that, that, um, uh, it was going to sell it all. And in like New York, I mean, we sold like 20,000 copies in like a month, you know, it was like, it, it wow. was like a lot, you know, and it was just all the kids that our friends who, who were coming to the shows in Brooklyn and, and, you know, all over the city and, you know, like, Oh, they finally put a record out. All right, cool. Let's buy it. Back then people bought records, you know? And, um, and then we got the opportunity to go tour, um, with our friends from a band called Mucky Pup from, from New Jersey came out of nowhere. And we're like, Hey, we really like your band. You want to come to Europe? And, uh, for us, that was just like the craziest thing. You know, we were like, what do you mean? Is that even possible? And they were like, yeah, go get passports and, uh, you know, play some shows and save up the money to get a plane ticket. And then you guys can come with us and we'll tour Europe. Which was the craziest wow. thing because uh, we ended up going to Europe and living in a van uh, with these guys in Mucky Pub and doing like seven weeks traveling around Europe and the UK playing shows. And it turned out to be like a huge catalyst for us. You know, that one little tour over there kind of like got everybody really excited on Biohazard. And then we started going back. And, you know, re very early on, we were already touring Europe, you know, in the early 90s, we... We were there three, four times a year, you know, just like touring and building the band over there. And that, that kind of like fed into the whole thing. You know what I mean? It was like we would come home, we'd play in the States, and then we'd go back over there and we'd play over there. And we were selling clubs out. You know, it was crazy. It just kind of got, I don't know, it was like a case of like good timing or something. And just kind of like things happening the right way at the right time. But yeah, it just... Um, it just started getting popular, you know? Dude, that's so cool. And um, I remember thinking about this. Wasn't wasn't one of the guys or both the guys on a, on a Mucky Pup song? Yeah. Yeah, Billy and Evan. Yeah, they were on a record. sang on a, a, and, Mucky uh, Pup, a, you know, a Mucky Pup song called Three Dead Gophers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know the Bulldogs. I know the Bulldo Bulldogs dudes. Yeah. A lot of Jersey heads that we've had on the show have talked about the importance of Mucky yeah. Pup. Um, Dan was on the, was Dan in the band when you guys did that yeah. Europe tour? Yeah. Oh, see, that's awesome. Dan You're in a band with him now, and he took you to Europe yeah, then. He and it's I, fucking we've, great. We've known each other for many, many years. So, yeah. That's fucking awesome. That's even cooler to know now what you're doing with the band with him. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. So, to pull away from Biohazard, I'm kind of wondering where a young Danley Shuler's heads at at this point. Cause you go from being like, yeah, fuck it. I'll join biohazard. <laughs> and like two years later and you're, you're up. Did the idea or any thought or parents come in and say like, what are you going to do? Are you just going to fuck around with this band? Or like, what was your mindset? Not just playing shows and doing biohazard, but like, did you care about anything else at that point? Or was it just solely about the band? Well, I had no life, you know, I didn't care about yeah. anything. You know, I was just like, a kid, you know, who's just like, you know, I had my friends, my family was all, you know, my, my dad died when I was young and things kind of fell apart for us. And, and, um, you know, I had nothing at home, you know? So to me, the music and my friends and the band, that was the most important thing to me. You know, it, I mean, it was at the point back then where all I had was my girlfriend back home. And, and my handful of friends, um, I just wanted to stay on the road all the time. You know, I didn't care about anything. I didn't care what happened to me. I mean, we were fearless back then. We did some stupid stuff back then. I mean, we did things back then that I would never let my kids do now. 
And, um, but it was a different time, you know, it was a different time. And I, I didn't care. I just didn't care about anything. I was just way too busy being amazed that somebody was actually showing up every night when we played, you know, I was just constantly blown away, you know, like every month it was just like, Hey, you guys are going to Europe. Here's a, they would, you know, fax over a list of shows and I'd look at it and I'd go, wow, we're going to London. We're going to Paris. We're going to Rome. You know, we're going to Amsterdam. We're going to Denmark. And I, it was just like a fantasy. It was just like not even real, you know? And, um, you know, I just, I was just so grateful. Me personally, I was just really grateful. I felt lucky, you know, to be able to do it. I didn't care about anything else. I didn't think about anything else. And home didn't matter. So it was just like, just go do this, live on the road with the band and just like a, like a friggin' barbarian. And that's what we did. Now, I, I I love the idea of like a bunch of dudes from Brooklyn being like, "We're going to fucking Paris," <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> like I, I I imagine for all of you, this was like the most, um, like life changing moment. This the access and the exposure to being on tour, seeing all these different things. I mean, when you guys yeah. are going, this is like this is like a crazy time for Europe, you know, like, and yeah. this is long before the internet. And I imagine some of these shows were like, not always at rock clubs, but like they were still doing the squats or, you know, like yeah. it, it had to be such a crazy experience just in general for you being a kid. It from was the- crazy. It was crazy. I mean, there was a lot of nights we slept on the floor in the club after we played, you know, there was nights where we, uh, you know, we played squats and there were problems and, Everybody's shit got stolen and, you know, there was always an issue. There's always the, all the issues that go along with playing in a, in a punk rock communist squat like we played. I mean, there was a lot of that stuff back then. But, you know, it was never a dull moment. It was interesting. We met a lot of amazing people back then who, who I'm lucky enough to still call friends. And, um, you know, we were fearless. We had nothing to lose. You know, none of us had families. None of none of us had any ties to home, so we had nothing to lose. We didn't care. We were fearless, you know. Now I'm ter- I'm terrified of everything now. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got kids. I, I don't. You know. Back yeah, then it was just like I didn't care. Yeah, you know, you already kind of seen enough that you know what's going to be around the corner, or yeah. oh fuck, what can come around this corner? So it's a much different than being like, I don't give a fuck. I'm doing this anyway. I get it. Yeah. Now. Is there a moment is there a moment that you can go to in that time period where things leveled up even further? Like was there a moment where you guys were like uh, yeah. is it is it Roadrunner? Is it something that precursor to Roadrunner? Like what was the moment where you're like, holy fuck, this band's actually gonna get even bigger? The moment for me where I realized that we had stepped in onto a different level of of popularity was in Europe, it was 1993, I think it was 1993, Um, we played the Dynamo Festival, the Dynamo Open Air Festival, Um, we played it again in 1994, 1995, the really big one. Yeah, I've seen a video of that thing, Jesus. Yeah, prior to that though, the year or the two years before that we played it. And we went on in the middle of the afternoon. Crowd was dead. I watched some of the other bands. It wasn't real exciting. We went on stage and it just transformed into a different environment. It was just something changed, you know. And I just remember looking out at the audience while we were playing middle of the afternoon on a farm you know, farmland in the middle of, uh, um, in the middle of Netherlands. And like, there was so much dust kicking up from the kids dancing so hard. It was just like a cloud over the sky, you know, it was crazy. And I just remember thinking to myself, wow, these kids are really into us. How the hell did this happen? And I remember after that show, we were interviewed by like TV and they like, I saw them walk away from other bands that were clearly much more popular than us 
to rush over to talk to the those kids from Brooklyn that just rocked the stage. You know, and I just remember something's happening. And from that point on, when we were in Europe, every show sold out. It was like every night we showed up, there were lines of people. And I remember um, that that's when things really started to change. And then in the United States, things really started to change when uh, the friggin' punishment video got on Beavis and Butthead. I remember that. That was like <laughs> a holy fuck moment. Yeah. Yeah, that was crazy because it was just like all of a sudden we were on TV every week and people were seeing it, you know, and it was just like it the reach of that of of MTV and all that stuff. It was so far reaching. I had no idea. We had no idea. You know, and it it like I remember this was on the Urban Discipline record. You like our manager being like, "Yo, you guys sold 10,000 records this week." Holy shit. And then the next week, yo, you guys sold 12,000 records this week. And then the week after that, yo, you guys sold 17,000 records this week. Like, it just kept growing. And uh, I was just like, wow, maybe this is like a thing now, you know? Maybe we could really do this. And, you know, it was moments like that that, that, that you know, informed us like, hey, you guys are on to something. You know, maybe you should take it seriously and stop being a bunch of fucking jerk-offs. And start, you know, <laughs> taking it seriously and start, start getting to work, you know, which we did. When, when the band starts getting noticed, is that the impetus or that was the catalyst to get you guys added to the Judgment Night soundtrack? Um, well, the, the Judgment Night soundtrack thing kind of happened a little later on. Oh, all right, so this is still earlier on. Okay, I get it. Yeah, that happened a little later on, and that was uh, because of our connection with, you know, the late great Scott Koenig, who was our who became our manager in 1991. Yeah. Scott worked for he worked with Rick Rubin, and uh, Scott was there at the beginning of Def Jam Records and Rush Artist Management, and uh, Scott signed us to Rush Artist Management. So we were working with Scott, and we were in, at Def Jam every day. And uh, one day, Russell Simmons was like, hey, you guys want to um, do a song for this movie, you know, Judgment Night. We want to put we're putting together a soundtrack. I forget who put it together. Um, but they were like, yeah, we want rock bands and rap bands and all that stuff. And and that's how that really came together. We obviously we had already done the Onyx Slam thing with those guys yeah. with Onyx. We did that in 1993 or 1994, and that was like a really cool thing amongst, amongst like you know the kids in the street back then. It was uh, that was a cool thing that really brought a lot of attention to our bands. Um, so we got back together with Onyx and we did the Judgment Night song, and uh, yeah, that was a cool thing. It was a cool thing to do. I feel like you guys had such a cool different growth into like heavy metal at the time when we're talking about. It, I'm like a super long hair. Every yeah. Saturday night was heavy, heavy headbangers ball, hanging yeah. with my friends, watching every Beavis and Butthead, yeah. and um, seeing by there was actually a video that you guys had that would eventually come out on one of these like cassettes that you could get every month. It was called like Rock Video Monthly, and that cassette came and it was like I think I watched that Punishment on VHS <laughs> so many fucking times. Yeah, like like that was like such a thing, and I remember all of us being long hairs, but none of us being from the suburbs. So we're like, all right, this is like a hard band, but they're they're from the neighbor. Like, it really resonated, and um, the at some point, you guys, uh, is it before this starts happening or right as this happens that you guys link up with Sick of It All and you guys do that? Um, no, Sick of It All was earlier than that. All right, yeah, I got my time yeah. switch up. So when you guys linked up with Sick yeah. of It All, obviously you know them because they're New York hardcore. They're Sick of It All. How was that? Because that ended up being like another iconic yeah. tour period just for like punk and hardcore in general, like Sick of It All and Biohazard yeah. and Sheer Yeah, I was, that was one of the coolest tours we ever did. And I was really excited when that got put together because I was like, yes, you know, Sheer Terror is coming out. That's going to be awesome, you know, and, and every night Sick of It All. I was like, yeah, great. But Sick of It All, they weren't that psyched to be on tour with us, I remember, because they kind of wanted to do something that was like a really like really hardcore tour 
and we we were still kind of like half a metal band, you know. It wasn't like what they were looking to do, but it ended up working out. I mean, we all got along so well, you know. I and I mean, once they realized like we were just fans of their band, like every night we would watch Sick of It All, and we would just be like, "Oh, Sick of It All's so great," you know what I mean? Like there was no like jealousy between the bands. It wasn't like, oh, we got to blow them away tonight. It was just like, yo, we just got off stage. I can't talk. I got to go watch Sick of It All right now. You know what I mean? I got to go watch Sheer Terror right now. For me, I was just like, I was in heaven because it was like two of my favorite bands at the time we were on tour with. And I was just like, this is friggin' awesome. Plus, we had an awesome crew of our friends with us. You know what I mean? It was like all these guys, everybody was from New York. Everybody knew each other. And it was hilarious every day. You know, Toby was there working for Sick of It All with Isaac. We had Minus with us on that tour, you know. So you can imagine the madness and hijinks that ensued on that tour. It was a great time. It was classic, hilarious, you know. That was my first hardcore show um, in Philadelphia at the TLA. Yeah, really? Like, at where? At the uh, Theater yeah, Living Yeah, that was Arts? my first hardcore show. And I remember, I remember specifically – at the biohazard show at single point it was during uh either your set or sick of it all set it was during your set uh where everybody you just mentioned was basically shirtless on stage basically telling security like we'll fuck you all up and we were so psyched like yeah fuck them guys up you know like um and i was just like in this moment being crazy young going to all these metal shows and that was like my first hardcore show and I love seeing a band with all their friends being like, fuck you. We run this shit. Like that was like the most like, yes, this is the most hardcore shit possible. So I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I was going to bring up like, yo, when you guys played here, you guys had like 13 guys on the road with you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody came down from New York to see that Philly show. I remember that my girlfriend was there, my wife now. Um, yeah, that was a, a big night. I remember, but, uh, yeah, that show was great. That, that those shows, on that tour were amazing because it was just like I said, for me, it was just so much fun to like, you know, watch sheer terror, hilarious every night, you know, and then get to play and then get to watch sick of it all, just destroy the place, you know, and, and all the insanity that, that went on with it. It was just, uh, that was a great, great, great time, man. That was 1992. When you um when you think about that and then like what would come after for the band, is there ever a time where yeah. like management or someone was trying to steer you away from those kind of tours, or were you guys always? Because I mean, I think I seen you guys open like a year or two later for fucking Cypress Hill. Like I felt like you guys were the band that would have your own shows that would kill, but you guys would also play with and support so many different acts. I wonder if it was you guys or management that had a hand in how many different kind of tours you guys were taking on? Well, um, definitely, you know, Scott Koenig, our manager was like always looking for cool stuff for us to do. And because of his connections with Def Jam in New York, um, we, you know, we were able to get on shows with like House of Pain and things like that early on. And we were open to do anything. We like our whole thing. Like I remember when Wu-Tang, the Wu-Tang Clan was coming out of New York. We, we were trying to put together um, us doing a song with them and doing a tour with them. Like, we would, we just wanted to be, you know, whatever was happening, whatever was the music in the street at the moment, whatever we liked, we wanted to latch on to and play and, and just show the world how cool it all was, you know? And, you know, our attitude when we were doing our own shows, like Biohazard Headline shows, was we always wanted to put on all the bands that we love from our hometown. You know what I mean? Like there were so many bands from New York, from Brooklyn that were great, great bands from that era. And I just remember like every time we were playing like a New York show or a local show, it was always like, yo, who are we going to get to open? You know, let's get Marauder. Let's get E-Town Concrete. Let's get, you know, let's see if Madball's ready to play. Let's see, you know, it was always like, always get other New York bands on the bill and show everybody how awesome this whole thing was. And I remember Evan, Evan had a great vision back then. And when I look back at it now, he was like a hundred percent right. 
I remember years ago, like way at the beginning, before like Lollapalooza ever happened or anything like that, Evan sitting me down and being like, yo, man, we should do a f- traveling festival of every band we love. And it doesn't matter what kind of music they play. You know, it could be us. It could be the Wu-Tang Clan. It could be Cypress Hill. It could be Agnostic Front. We, we got to get those bands together and do a festival and just bring it around the world. That would be dope. You know, and like two years later, Lollapalooza was doing exactly that and people were going buck wild. And I was like, man, Evan had the idea for that. You know, like that was like, and we all kind of had that way of thinking. Like we just wanted to do whatever we thought was cool. We wanted to hook up our friends' bands and we wanted to show the world how cool this thing was that we were all all a part of. You know, not just Biohazard, but, you know, all the bands, all the New York bands, you know. No, I've seen Biohazard with every one of those bands. I've seen Biohazard. Um, you guys, uh, Biohazard just being like brother bands, but like the Life Agony band, Hypo Negative. Yeah. There are so many bands that are connected to you guys. And then at a certain point in time, it felt like you guys were also able like, uh, to do a support tour for arenas with fucking Pantera. Yeah. So you had this like such a wide berth of – who you were able to play and support, who you were able to just be on tour with. And then also, as you guys were the bigger band, always thinking about the other bands and bringing them up. And it's a rare thing. Often I see bands grow from the underground and they get a little bit further up and they don't think to help pull some bands up. Mm-hmm. And I I'd always thought that was like the coolest thing. Like um, years, you know, not staying chrono- uh, chronologically mm-hmm. here. Um, around Halloween in 97, you guys had, Bio it was twenty five to life or biohazard twenty five to life in E Town Concrete. Mm, yeah, and that was like I mean you guys could have took anybody the fuck you want on mm. there, you know. But you guys did Asbury Park and fucking CC's. You guys were still doing the small clubs, yeah. the Western PA clubs. Yeah, I mean it was just a real cool. It was a real cool thing that Biohazard was uh, able to do. That I think if there was like some rock star moments, it was never with the bands. It was never with the fucking the support and the shows that you guys would play guys are very versatile in what you guys were playing. And it was actually mm. fucking awesome. Yeah. Thanks man. I, I'm glad you, you saw it that way because that was, that was how we did it. I mean, we just kind of just wanted to do what we thought was cool. Wanted to put on bands that, you know, with our friends who were in the bands, the bands that we thought were really great. And, you know, it was just, I couldn't, we couldn't understand how come the rest of the world didn't know who all these great bands were? You know, we were like, damn, dude, people got to wake up to how great this shit is because there's some great shit out there, you know? The hardcore bands from New York, the original hardcore bands from New York, um, you know, and all that stuff. It was just, it, it, it was so, to us, it was so great, so legendary, and still so underground. It was just a crime, you know? But, uh, yeah. I uh I heard a story that I heard a story that Rabies was one time trying to sing for you guys. He was trying to tell Evan that Evan needs to just play bass. Is that a real story or is that made up? Well, I I was there one time. We had a conversation with Ray, and he was like, he did say, you know, he was like, you know, you you know you you you. He was talking to Evan, and he was like, you know, you play the bass and you sing, but you know, it would be better if you just had a singer, and that's where I come in. And, you know, you know, there's already four of you guys. We could, I'll just come in and I'll sing. And, you know, you guys be the backup band. And we were like, wow, yeah, that would be amazing. You know, but then it just never, you know, happened. <laughs> yeah, it never happened. But no, it know, never I, I remember um, <laughs> Ray funny. working at uh, some of the shows later on, you know, because he always did like security at shows and stuff. And uh, I remember talking to him afterwards and he was always like, Psh. You guys should have got me up there, man. Forget it. You would have blown up by now. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's fucking great. Obviously, we were kind of limited with time here, and I wanted to just have you on. I, I, I brought up the fact that you're playing now with Dan Anastasi in Kings yeah. Never Die. I want to bring it back on, and we'll go further. We'll get not just to, you know more biohazard, but just what else you've been yeah. doing, what's okay. going on. Um, I thank you for making the time. Thank you, bro. I appreciate um, it. Shout out your social. No, thank you. Um, send out your social medias. We'll tag you in on, on the tiacpodcast.com. 
and I'd love to be able to bring you back on and we can just yeah, go Yeah, yeah, no, this. absolutely. We'll, we'll finish it up. We'll, we'll go further and, and put it all together. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, do you want anybody to reach out on your Instagram or anything like that? Well, um, uh, I'm, I'm on social media, Danny Biohazard. Uh, you know, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. But uh, really, it's, it's all about Kings Never Die, you know. Kings Never Die official um, is, is our, our uh, Instagram thing. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we're relaunching the band. You know, we got a, a whole record done of all new songs, and it's really great. And um, we're, we're looking to play shows and get out there right now and, you know, just start at the bottom and build it back up, build it up and just uh, introduce people to it. And I think it's going to be a cool thing. I think a lot of people are going to be surprised when they hear the new music. Um, so, yeah, that's that's it. That's what we're doing now. It's Kings Never Die thing. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll tag all that stuff. And um, thank you for coming on. And we'll definitely get a part right, two man. together. All right. Thanks, Joe. Hey, man, if you didn't enjoy that one, I don't know what to tell you. Like I said, Danny Schuler is one of the most kind, sociable, affable, no ego having motherfuckers. I don't know if it's because he's from Brooklyn and just very happy for what his band gave to him. Just one of these people that you can talk to forever. So glad to have him on. And like I said, I know this was a shorter one. We're going to bring Danny back. We'll go deeper. Make sure to check out TIHCpodcast.com. So that way you can check out the links to Kings Never Die. You can read read the stuff that they got going on. And also you can check out Danny, Danny Biohazard, Instagram and Twitter. And again, support phillyhcshows.com. Support from within podcast. Support the Rule of Three podcast, which our brother Richie Mancuso, he is now a father. Me, Richie, and the G were just talking in the chat. We were going to try to get an episode coming out soon for you. Stay tuned for that. That's going to be coming out. Make sure you check out the Broad Street Breakdown. God willing, Vinny and the boys get another fucking episode going. Richie busy with the family. The Post America podcast is a little on hold, but he's going to be popping out some new episodes. Make sure to check them the fuck out. And support hardcore everywhere you can. Support everybody. Simple. 2022, a lot of shit's changing. A lot of things are going to be Coming back to the word I don't even want to say because everyone says the normal, but let's keep our fingers crossed. You can reach us also at thisishardcorefest.com, com, the Joe Hardcore on Instagram. You can find me wherever you need to. Thank you for supporting, and we'll talk to you next week.